okay? Okay, great. Uh, welcome to What is Good Solar, a program presented by the Acorn Renewable Energy Cooperative. Uh, my name is Andrea Murray, and I am a board member of the Acorn Renewable Energy Cooperative. And we are delighted to present this panel discussion for you this evening. A few quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or put it on vibrate. We are filming this presentation and it will be made available on Middlebury Community Television. As a result, we are slaves to the microphone. <laughs> So um, we will ask the panelists to please use the microphones. And also during questions and answers, we will ask members of the audience. So we'll try and pass this around as Dick just told me, Phil Donahue style. So we'll do our best. Let's see here. Um, the, the way we are organizing this discussion this evening is one hour of question and answer. We have some prepared questions. Hopefully, some of those are the questions you all have in your minds as well for the panelists. And then the second half an hour or however long it goes will be questions from you folks for the panelists. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Su Susie Hodgson uh, Susie is a member also of the Board of Directors of ACORN, and Susie brings many years of business and community experience to our board. Um, she was the Program Director for Environmental Strategy at the University of Surrey in the UK. She is co-founder of Your Farm Stand, a multi-farm online marketing venture, as well as chair of the Charlotte Energy Committee and member of the Charlotte Conservation Commission. <laughs> Was, oh, oops. Susie also works at the UVM Extension and focuses on issues with respect to climate change and sustainable agriculture issues. And I know she's very, very interested in the issue we're approaching this evening. So please join me in welcoming Susie. Thank you, Andrea. What a wonderful introduction. And I'm sure we're all here because we're very interested. I just wanted to point out, we do have restrooms over there in that door if anyone needs that. And there's plenty of food here, so don't be embarrassed to sneak off and grab a drink. Well, just water and cider and, <laughs> and cheese and vegetables. So that's there for all of you to enjoy and keep us going throughout this evening session. So I'd like to introduce our four panelists. And thank you so much for all taking the time out to be with us today. So starting on our right, we have Dorothy, otherwise known as Dottie Schnorr, who has worked for Green Mountain Power since 1982. So she really knows Green Mountain Power inside and out. Her main job is media relations and corporate communications. And she's been very much involved with outreach and community communications. Then we have Gabrielle Stebbins next to Dottie, <coughs> who is now a consultant at Energy Futures Group. But um, prior to that, for about seven years, many of you probably know her as the um, Executive Director of Renewable Energy, Vermont, where she represented her constituencies of renewable energy businesses and policy and regulation. Mm -hmm. And before that, some of you may know her from Efficiency Vermont, part of um, Vermont Energy Investment Corps. Um, the other interesting thing about Gabrielle, which I learned when she sent me her bio, is she is trained as a classical violinist. And I'm always amazed at how many people in Vermont have these incredible professions and then they're classical pianists, violinists, <laughs> great singers, which brings us to our next panelist. <laughs> I almost wish they could all sing tonight, but we won't, we won't go that far. Our, our next panelist is Ben Marks, who sings in a well, community chorus, community chorus <laughs> among some other people in the audience. Uh, but he's a regulatory attorney. He is also on the board, Acorn Energy Co-op Board as a director. He teaches an energy policy course at Middlebury College, and he's on the select board at, in the town of Cornwall. I just found he actually chairs the select board. So what's great about our panel tonight, we will be hearing, we can hear from the local town perspective as well as from the regional and state perspective. And then we have Kevin Jones, who made the trip up from Vermont Law School. Thanks, Kevin, for joining us. He is the Deputy Director of the Institute for Energy and the Environment at Vermont Law School. 
He leads the Vermont Law School Energy Clinic, and some of you may have come across his guide to community energy projects. He may refer to that in our talk. Prior to joining Vermont Law School, he was in the big city, as in the Big Apple, city of New York, where he was the director of energy policy. So he brings a lot of years of experience to the table, both outside of Vermont in New York to, and to here. Um, so I think <coughs> we're ready to move forward. And as Andrea said, we have um, organized this, so we have some questions that we've come up with, which may align with some of your questions, and then we'll move on. So bear with me a second while I get to my list. So our first question is, I'd like the panelists, and I think we'll start with Gabrielle, is just to describe the state of play of solar in, in Vermont and how does solar fit into the energy mix of today. So really kind of where we are today, maybe highlight where we've been. There's a, been a lot of immediate attention on solar development and where you think we're going. And in particular, our goal on our state target is 90% of renewables by 2050. We know solar is a large part of that mix and how, how are we going to get there? Uh, sure. So I would describe uh, energy today, both in Vermont as well as nationally and internationally, as in uh, being a, a very uh, broad state of flux and transition. Um, you know, we're transitioning from 100 plus years of traditional fuels, um, oil, coal, gas, uh, towards more intermittent renewable resources that take up more space and are more visible and are more spread out throughout our neighborhoods and throughout our communities and throughout our state. Um, so first and foremost, I'd say a lot of transition and a lot of flux. Um, right now, if you look at our goal of 90% of all of our energy to come from renewables by 2050, that requires an incredible amount of efficiency and conservation, and then a whole lot more renewables if we're going to get there. Um, right now, the majority of our uh, electricity um, looks pretty clean compared to how much energy we get from transportation or for transportation and how much we do for how much we need for heating our buildings. Um, and most of that actually comes from in Canada, uh, in Quebec, from uh, Hydro-Quebec. So I think we have a long ways to go. We've made phenomenal progress over the last 15, 16 years um, in terms of seeing a lot more solar uh, in our backyards, on our rooftops, in our fields, um, also wind, uh, also seeing some of our hydro dams uh, refurbished from the 1970s onwards. But frankly, we have quite a long ways to go if we're going to try and get to that 90 by 2050 goal. It's definitely achievable um, from a technology perspective. Um, I think the hardest part, which is probably why we're here, is what that means in terms of uh, what it looks like in our, in our backyards, in our neighborhoods, in our farm fields, and what that means in terms of a working landscape. Uh, for some, it, you know, when they see renewables, uh, they see hope and they see progress and they see more jobs. We have about 15, 16,000 jobs here in Vermont um, from, rene from renewables and efficiency. Um, and for others, it means a real change. So uh, I'd say solar is a huge part of how we're going to get from A to Z. Um, and, uh, but it is only one part compared to the other technology options that we have. Um, and frankly, we also need quite a bit more storage and we also need to get a lot more creative in terms of our transportation and in terms of denser development and having more people live closer in town. Um, and, uh, you know, that means more public housing or not necessarily public, but more, you know, housing downtown. Um, so there are all sorts of pieces to get to this 90% by 2050 goal. So there's a huge part, uh, but we have a lot more to go. I would only add that there's, uh, uh, Gabrielle was talking about the, uh, the evolving public discussion about what we want our state to look like, where we live, and how we move from point A to point B. There's uh, an equal amount of flux, I would say, in the, the regulatory and uh, legislative environments where uh, the legislature and the, the various regulatory bodies are hearing, um, I think, a very broad range of very deeply felt opinions about uh, how renewables get built out in our state. Um, the, it, it's, I, I think, not an, an exaggeration to say that the the pace at which those renewables get built is going to be, in large part, uh, a response to the regulatory uh, environment. And it's not just Vermont regulatory. There, there's a federal component to this. There are tax law components to this, all of which sort of create this 
this vortex of um, uh, of rules in which the people who uh, will have to spend the money to make this all happen have to operate. And so to the extent that there's uh, uncertainty or a, uh, uh, an evolving public conversation about uh, these policies which, um, which is unresolved, uh, you're going to see, I think, less development um, as people try to figure out um, what the likelihood of their making back their investments are. Kevin, you may want to comment on this, this state of flux, and particularly how does a community grapple with in our backyard? In a negative sense, we may call it NIMBYism, but we're trying to balance this larger public goal of reaching the renewable target with communities finding, locating solar in the right place. <clears throat> First, I'd like to talk about this, this state of flux, because I don't, you know, any, anyone that's, that's read some of my writings um, won't be surprised um, to hear me say that that I think Vermont has one of the most fundamentally flawed renewable energy policies um, in the country. And um, the reason that, that I say that, if you look at the recent report put out by three of my students, our energy clinic, which I think you know, um, is um, excellent analytical work and largely based on the state's comprehensive energy plan, um, a lot of Vermonters are surprised to see, um, after they drive around Vermont, they see a lot of wind turbines in Vermont, they see a lot of solar development in Vermont, but um, a lot of Vermonters were, were surprised to pick up the Rutland Herald or um, to read VT Digger or read the Burlington Free Press or, or other papers and, and see the results um, from my students' research, which essentially says that Vermont you know, today has 0% of its solar energy. 0% um, um, energy comes from solar and 0% of its energy comes, comes from wind. And we could have added pretty much 0% comes from biomass um, too, and maybe we should have added, added that. And, and the disconnect there, um, largely is that we have um, a state policy that has been focused on um, supporting renewable energy development in Vermont, but not renewable, renewable energy development for Vermonters. And so we've, we've um, had a framework that set up um, a lot of projects be built here, but um, incentives so that the renewable energy credits are stripped from those projects are sold largely into the Mass and Connecticut renewable portfolio standards. So. Um, um, when you come to the land use impacts, I mean, I, I don't even know how to talk about those because when we're, when we're telling people that we need to um, make sacrifices, you know, um, whether it's, you know, wind on our ridgelines or solar um, maybe impacting um, what, what is, is aesthetics or, or, or other reasons, um, but in, and we've implied to them that it's something that's um, adding additional benefit to climate change when the, the, the real public policy is that um, our state policies are set up to essentially um, sell all that, um, that carbon benefit to Mass and Connecticut for a profit. Um, and, and some of it um, um, comes back to stuff that GMP and the utilities do, comes back and the revenue is credited to rate payers. But from our net metering programs, that's just an additional profit beyond the 19 cents that goes to the, to the developer of the project. So um, one of the other conclusions that was taken on the state energy plan in here is over the last 10 years, Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions for the electric sector have doubled. And there's largely two reasons, public policy reasons, that have doubled our electric sector greenhouse gas emissions over the last 10 years. One is, um, you know, the, the retirement, and originally the sale and retirement of Vermont Yankee, um, because um, the low carbon nuclear power has been, re been replaced largely with, uh, with out of state nuclear power and, and fossil fuel power. And the other reason um, is our renewable energy policies. Because when you take um, any of these, um, renewable energy resources, run, whether it's solar or wind, and you strip the renewable energy credits off them, it's like exporting the renewable energy out of state, and we have to replace that with something else. And the accurate greenhouse gas accounting, I've worked you know, in this industry for 25 years. I've, I've um, worked on environmental disclosure, renewable portfolio standards, retail access programs. I've spun the numbers in about any way that you can. And um, you know, um, the facts of the greenhouse gas accounting are that a lot of renewable energy projects are actually um, um, resulting in Vermont getting credit for the fossil fuel and nuclear power um, throughout New England um, because of the fact that we're selling the renewable energy credits out of out of state in, in Mass and Connecticut. Our Mass and Connecticut ratepayers are, are 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 the ones that are actually stepping up and paying the full cost of those renewables and can claim those renewables, and we're actually um, um, adding to our mix a lot of uh, high carbon in, in nuclear energy. I mean, you look at you go to GMP's website and you look at the resource mix for GMP and. I think it's about 56, 58% fossil fuel in, in nuclear, and then there's a lot of Vermont Yankee, 
and what you'll see on GMP's website is, is you know, that, that there's no solar or, or wind in there, and, and that's consistent with uh, the public policies um, in the state, and GMP's not doing anything more than, than following through on, you know, the incentives and the public policies. Now, um, I think GMP's probably doing a little lobbying to support some of those, um, and, and so we have a lot of um, people in the political landscape and other, other places going around the state and, and talking about how we're green and we're cheap, and um, you know we're cheaper than 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 electricity in, in places like Massachusetts, Connecticut. And well, one of those reasons are is the people in Massachusetts, Connecticut have honest renewable energy policies and are paying the full cost of those of those resources. And um, um, the reason we're cheap is because we're buying a lot of you know fossil fuel and nuclear energy, um, and that's what that's what our our resources are getting getting counted. And unfortunately. Um, you know, a lot of people and Heather, some of the can we, can we just comment on yeah. that? I know, I know there's a lot yes. to pick apart here and you've said some really interesting points, but I think we might want to have someone comment about, well, first let's talk about what re renewable energy credits are and also the fact that in energy it's a marketplace. So we have sellers of renewable energy credits and we have, we have also buyers. Is, is there a problem with the marketplace being bigger than Vermont? I mean, there may be arguments for having renewable energy in places where land costs less or where there's more land. So we have a lot of regional and we know global benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I take we have a problem with accounting if we're both claiming the renewable energy credit attribute in Vermont and in Massachusetts and something's wrong because we won't get, we won't represent a real total of the r improvements we're making. But maybe, Dottie, you can address yeah. this, this marketplace issue. have got a issue. world, a bunch of different points there. So first of all, we're not double counting. When we sell a REC, we do not count it as renewable energy for our customers. So back up a little bit. I'm assuming it looks like a crowd that knows a lot about energy. Does everybody understand what the RECs are in the REC market? Um, this well, actually, raise your hand if, 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 if this is something. Do we want an explanation of, of renewable energy credits, RECs? Is that helpful, or should we move? Okay. Yeah, let's go. Let's start there okay. first. With so, so when states started setting out requirements for having a certain amount of their energy come from renewable power, there needed to be a mechanism for utilities that um, maybe they had all the electrons that they needed already, but they needed some of it to be renewable. So a way to basically incent the most cost-effective renewable energy to be built was to separate out the renewableness of it from the electron that drives your motors and turns your light on, lights on, basically getting what we call the bragging rights for it. So if so then if a utility buys those bragging rights, they're putting money in that helps that renewable project being built. So if you, if you sell those bragging rights, you can't claim it as renewable for your customers. What that does, so New England as a region, um, we buy and we sell renewable energy credits and it helps get the most cost effective renewable energy in the ground. So Green Mountain Power, sells uh, in accordance with Vermont practice, we sell most of the RECs for our wind project and solar projects. However, Vermont state law beginning next year in 2017 will require us to have 55% of our electricity come from renewable resources. And we will do that and they have, they, there's a lot of effort and negotiation went into, into how much we would have and that amount increases over the years so that we gradually, or speedily, whatever, at a certain pace, increase the amount of renewable energy that is in our portfolio. And it's a way that the legislature came together to say, we have to balance cost and renewable. We want more renewable, but the cost of electricity is a real issue. I mean, we have people that can't pay their electric bills and buy food at the same time. So we have to pay real attention to that. We can't just say, charge anything you want, but yet we do all feel the need to rapidly increase the amount of renewable energy. So we have set, there's a state policy now that we will, utilities will have 55% renewable and that will be going up. There are projects being built that we will sell RECs for, but then those RECs will be available to us in the future as we increase the amount of renewable power. It's a good way for us to get good cost effective um, renewable energy built here, and then we can um, we can use those recs as we move into the future. Okay, so Dottie, are we agreeing that in in the past, before 
there was proper accounting. So there were some problems, and now, given new legislation, we, we have we, proper accounting? Is if you go to our web, no we've, no, we've been accounting for it correctly. If you go to our web page, we have two charts. One shows the mix that our customers get. But then you look at that and you go, gosh, there's only a tiny sliver of renewable energy. I thought they had this big wind plant up in Lowell and that sort of stuff. And we have a link to that shows where we source it, and we show 18% of our power is sourced from renewable energy. 9% is wind, we have solar, biomass, um, hydro. But 18% right now we are selling the RECs for. So it's renewable energy, it's renewable energy, where it's generated, but we don't count as renewable energy for our customers. It is, however, more renewable energy on the New England grid. Okay. Kevin, you wanted to comment? Yes, I have a couple. Um, um, a, a couple things. First of all, the, the view that, that Act 56 actually resolved this problem is, is, is absolutely um, um, incorrect. I mean, Act, Act 56 was designed um, in, you know, um, largely um, over the controversy because we had um, the state of Connecticut was actually threatening not to allow any of the renewable energy credits from Vermont projects to be counted in Connecticut to their RPS um, because they saw that saw as, as double counting. They were counting it, counting it toward our speed program and then selling it, um, the RECs out of state. Can I hold you just a second? So RPS is Renewable Portfolio, renewable portfolio Standards, standard. yep. and speed is? It was standard, sustainably priced standard. electricity for economic development, something like something and like that. Connecticut speed. as a state had was responding differently to RECs than Vermont. The, they retire, like, like all of the other states that have Renewable Portfolio Standards, they actually retire the RECs for that. That's the only honest way to claim them. Right. So Connecticut was, was threatening, um, you know, and, and a lot of the brokers in the market were saying we're not going to take RECs anymore. And so there was this, this, this concern. Um, the Connecticut's the only state that's, that's actually taken the biomass RECs off McNeil and, and some of the other wood um, facilities in the state. And so entities like BD and others um, that owned a piece of that were, were going to have some rate shock because um, they're largely selling, you know, all of those premium RECs out of state. And um, um, so uh, essentially, one of, the, one of the principles of Act 56 is designed is it's set up to, in perpetuity, allow all of the speed, the, the historic speed wrecks to be sold out of state, um, you know, um, you know um, till the end of time, the way that's set up. The tier one is set up with a one cent per kilowatt hour penalty, and that's where all the pre-June um, um, 30th, 2015 projects, um, you know, could qualify. And so um, all the wind projects, I, you know, my students could do, could do an update on our report, you know, um, today, you know, and tell us what, it, what, the, what Act 60 or Act 56 and our, and our proposed changes to the net metering laws will, um, will give us in 2032. I can, I can, you know, come back, we can come back in 2032 and see if I'm, I'm right if we don't change the law. But um, we'll essentially have 0% wind in the mix still because all of the wind is incented to be sold out of state because you can sell it for, you know, um, five cents a kilowatt hour, and the penalty um, for um, for not doing that is only one cent a kilowatt hour. And there's a, a lot of um, essentially we're going to count in tier one all of the cheap um, wrecks that no other state counts. We're going to vacuum up off the floor. We're going to take all the 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 fraction of a cent wrecks that 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 none of the other states count because they're old. You know they're um, they they don't qualify for their programs, um, and and count that towards tier one. And if you look at the only, the only thing that we'll have for solar and in-state distributed in 2032, I mean, we're, we're talking, what, 16 years um, um, from now, in 2032 we'll have um, something like 10% um, solar in the state um, um, under this. And that, that, the way the net metering rule is set up, essentially where um, the incentive is going to be, people that want to do community solar, um, colleges like Middlebury College and Vermont Law School that did did um, solar where they retired the RECs, which is additional and provides carbon bent, carbon reduction for here in Vermont. Um, all of those people are, are, are um, um, going to be penalized significantly from that net metering rule, and the incentive is going to um, um, turn all of the net metered RECs over to, over to the utilities. And thus, you know, um, the only in-state distributed resources that will be developed will be this distributed tier of 10%. It starts at 1% in 2017 and 0.6% per year. And we get, so we get to 2032 and I can tell you what the mix will be. It'll be 0% it'll be, um, wind, 10% um, solar, and then this 55, now we'll have a, the 55% goal will have gone up to 65%, but it'll be, it'll be um, um, exist of Hydro-Quebec, um, 
um, and um, these cheap wrecks that nobody else, you know, all the all the hydro and other things that no other states, that no other states counts because the incentive is to s continue to sell the premium renewables out of state. Um, Act 56 in in no way um, is designed um, to get Vermont to a, an honest, you know, um, um, goal where we're we're developing significant um, in-state renewables. Yeah. So, I'm wondering how a consumer can even figure out what this all means. I mean, there's, so I guess my, my question is, is, is regulation these tiers actually helping us get to this target or hindering us? I mean, if we, st if we didn't have renewable energy credits, how much difference would they make? Because uh, I heard at one point you said they weren't worth a very lot. Are they essential to developing renewable energy? And if, if we can just get proper accounting, well, would we be okay? Yeah. yeah. Let me just say first. I mean, I, I'm a proponent of, of of recs and rec markets. I mean, they were, as Dottie said, they were they were created for uh, for a legitimate reason. I mean, uh, um, um, and, and the idea is, you know, where you have, I mean, uh, a customer in New York City that wants to pay a premium to support renewable energy um, can honestly understand this, that they're not two pe two people double counting um, this resource. So um, the, the idea of recs and and the fact of the matter is, you know, Dottie talks about the separating the electrons from the from the, um, the the green attributes, so actually, well, we don't we don't know where the electrons yeah. really go either. I mean, you put electricity in the grid, it follows the path of least resistance, travels at the yeah. speed of light. We don't we don't know who's even really getting the uh, getting getting the electrons off the system. And the reason we set up rec markets were to to allow people to understand that there's an honest accounting, and, and if the the green energy and the renewable that you put in will equal the green that you you come out, and so that people won't won't double count if you do that. So it's not it's not recs or rec markets. It's it's to me, fundamentally flawed public policy, which essentially gives people the perception, you know, um, that we're developing renewables in Vermont, um, but really selling, you know, exporting. Um, what, what can someone the, in this room, I, I don't know everybody here up there, thinking about putting solar on the roof, thinking about investing in community solar, what advice can, maybe Dottie, you can start with this, and then Gabriel, what advice would you give people in this room to try and understand how do I make a decision? So I, I, I think what's solar? just important to understand is, is if you own the RECs or not and what you do with the RECs. I mean, we're very clear when we sell the RECs, whether it's renewable for our customers or not. For so for somebody looking to do solar, you have the option to retain the RECs yourself and then it's solar. So if you're buying into community solar, find out what's happening with the RECs. You don't need to understand all the policy of what's doing, what, what's going to happen by 2032 or what's going to happen by 2050. Just find out if, um, if you own the RECs or not. But I'd also like to talk about some of the other values of solar. Um, so we're moving really to a different kind, a different way of delivering power to customers. And that is in the past, we used to have all sorts of big central electric generating stations and big transmission lines that shipped it all around. And we're finding, we're believing that we're all going to be better served if the generation is much closer to the people that use it um, by putting smaller solar plants throughout, throughout the area, close to where people use it, it does a couple of things. First of all, you can avoid the big expense of building transmission, and we're saving a lot of money in Vermont already by having more distributed generation by avoiding transmission. It also has some great reliability benefits because the generation is close to where people are using it. And I was thinking just the other day, what was it, about 10 years or so ago, we had a big blackout on the East Coast, but Vermont was pretty much safe from that. One of the reasons we were saved is that we had happened to have, at that point, a lot of hydro generation. So the local generation in Vermont helped keep the lights on in Vermont. And as we move forward, having more distributed generation will help. Green Mountain Power is also doing a lot of work combining solar and battery storage, because battery storage technology is now to the point we can use it. We built um, a plant in Rutland that's two megawatts of solar and we paired it with four megawatts of battery storage. So it does a couple things. First of all, the cloud goes over the, the panels and the generation jumps down a little bit. The batteries can kick in, it can be a steady source. But also the circuit that that is on serves a section of Rutland that includes the Rutland High School. The Rutland High School is the Rutland Emergency Shelter. If we have another Hurricane Irene and the whole area goes black, we can operate that circuit indefinitely with the solar panels and the battery storage. So th that's an incredible reliability benefit to the people of Rutland that they're, 
that their emergency, sh emergency shelter will be operated by solar battery combination. And we're looking at other places where we can increase the resiliency of the power that we provide to customers by combining solar and battery. So that's a really important part of when you see this stuff developing. That's one of the huge benefits um, for our customers is that it helps lower costs and it helps increase reliability for our customers, which, and well, it's a, a so that, those are, are other benefits that we haven't yeah, mentioned yet. We have a question from our audience. So, okay. so I think Can part, you introduce yourself yes, first? my name is George Gross. I live in Shoreham and um, about a year and a half back, my wife and I were among the co-founders of a community solar project in Shoreham that eventually had to be put on the shelf for a variety of reasons, including the financial problems that we were having to make the whole business case hold together. So earlier in your um, statements, you indicated that it was okay for a customer to hold on to the RECs or to give them to the utility. What you failed to mention was that there's a significant penalty for those customers who choose to hold on to their RECs and retire them. And that's six cents a kilowatt hour as currently proposed by the net metering rules that are going into effect later this year and maybe also enacted in the law of a bill called S-230 that's currently in the legislature. And the, the difference of six cents a kilowatt hour uh, per kilowatt hour is substantial to a community solar project. It basically makes it impossible if you basically put strip that off from uh, the benefit that you get on solar kilowatt hours. So giving away the utility, uh, the renewable energy credits uh, is, is certainly one way to get that adder. But the drawback is you can no longer, as a community solar project, claim you're a renewable energy project. So. From our perspective, those of us who are advocating for community-owned solar as opposed to utility-owned power, uh, this is a severe setback, and, and my own household is going to probably have to react to this by doing our own solar project on our own property and pulling in the rules that are in effect this year. Yeah, I mean, that money does go along with the, the renewable value. That's why it's associated with it. Well, the, the, the rules, as, as folks up here have been saying, the rules are um, in, in flux. Um, I, I think in even this month there have been two separate drafts of, uh, of the, the net metering rule at the Public Service Board, which is Rule 5.100. I encourage you to all go read it if you want to have a sense of how these things are going to be managed in the future. I, I want to actually go up a level from where we are talking about, about what RECs are and, and who owns them to pose the fundamental problem that Vermont has in all of its public policy issues. That problem is that we are a small and relatively poor state. And what I mean by that is that we have a, a, a relatively fixed population and um, a, a, an amount of money that is generated by our gross domestic product which is fairly flat. What that means is that every single public policy initiative, whether it's renewable energy, or healthcare or anything else, basically comes out of the pockets of the same group of 660,000 people. That you can slice it and dice it in various ways, um, but but that's the challenge that we face. Um, the reason why uh, uh, George is facing the issues that he's facing now is that we're in this um, transitional moment. Uh, we at our in our family did put in a solar project at our house uh, last year and. Um, I guess we have about nine more years left of the, um, the solar adder that was in effect when, when we, we put it into place. If the, the rule goes into effect um, when, as it's proposed to, um, in year 10 of our solar system, we'll, we'll be charged um, some set of fees. And all of the financial calculations that we did about the, um, about the uh, efficacy of this generator for our family uh, will really be changed. Now, what's going on there? Well, at, at a certain level, the policymakers in the state have said, um, we're willing to give you a certain amount of benefit to, uh, as an incentive to invest your money to, to create this, this small amount of infrastructure. And you, you can scale up the argument to the size of a project that George was proposing um, or down to a, a single family. Um, but after 10 years, we think you've gotten enough benefit out of that and we, we need to sort of take from your other pocket in order to fund other stuff. The reason why RECs are such a, a hot topic for the state is that they represent an out-of-state subsidy 
for um, infrastructure that's being built here. That's money that does not have another source. There's no federal program. There's no uh, tax uh, that's being levied on, on folks to support that. Um, and I, I, not to put words in Dottie's mouth, but she might say that there is no free lunch. Now, it's, it's true that, um, that you can't claim, once those wrecks are sold, that the energy is renewable. Um, the only thing that I would say about that is, once again, taking the long view, that won't always be the case. So for those of us who expect to be alive in 2050, um, and if we are forced to uh, turn over our wrecks through a set of economic incentives, um, we can expect that nine-tenths of those will stay in the state because that's what the law currently says. Um, I, I personally feel a little bit uh, bitter about that because I feel like I'm already retiring the wrecks and helping the state towards its goal, and if I were to promise to never sell them, I should be counted towards the state's goal. But you have to understand that the state's goal isn't just to, to do renewable energy at a certain percentage. It's to try to fit it within a cost matrix um, that all the players can agree to. Um, not a very simple task, and one which I'm afraid is measured, I mean, the effects of which are gonna be measured in decades, um, not years or, um, or set, you know, discrete sessions of the, uh, the Vermont House. At least that's my, my perspective. Maybe Gabrielle has a different view of these things. Actually, I think um, you hit upon a lot of um, a, a lot of things that are, are very accurate. I mean, it's it's very challenging for people who uh, built a solar system on their roof two three years ago to find out that perhaps the rules will change and that ten years out um, you may not, or seven years out if you did it three years ago, you may not get the same adder. Um, and I, I think it's uh, th this is exactly why I started off with this entire landscape is in flux. We have uh, Rule dot uh, five one hundred um, that is all about net metering. It's about fifty pages long. It's been through three drafts, and there's a lot of tug of war going on here, not just in Vermont. And, and frankly, I mean, Vermont tends to have some of the most um, uh, some of the conversations that are most uh, discussable as compared to, say, uh, some places in um, the, the West or Hawaii where you actually see, you know, quite a bit of turf in terms of, uh, and, and significant turf in terms of um, utilities uh, having to re-envision what they are entirely. Uh, we've, we've come from 50, 60 years ago where utilities were regulated monopolies, they owned everything, to a model where now you can actually kind of discuss connect from the grid, and yet you still need the grid if you're going to be net metering. Um, so there, there's so many pieces here at the high level and the low level and the detailed level that I'm, I'm struggling to figure out how to actually say something that's helpful. Um, I guess I would say that it's really important to look at the long-term vision, which is, um, you know, I, 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 I guess I would disagree that in 2032 we're not going to have a different renewable um, landscape. I think we are. Uh, and to that point, Kevin, I, I would disagree with you. I, having worked at the State House for five years, um, state law changes every year. If we do see, um, you know, significant changes nationally and internationally in terms of the coal, oil, gas markets, um, we're going to see more and more global pressure towards renewables. Well, what does that mean in terms of overall costs? It probably means that overall costs reduce. So what does that mean in terms of what your renewable portfolio standard looks like? You're probably going to be able to see that over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you see renewable portfolio standards that change, that modify. Um, so I guess I would say this is all a work in progress. And uh, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, Kevin and others in 2012 showed up at the State House and said, we want the renewable energy credits to be part of the New England region. Well, they did that last year um, in, in Act 56, and it goes into effect January 1st, 2017. Is it perfect? No. Is it a perpetual work in progress? Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I would say is that uh, we, we are, to, to mangle a metaphor, um, trying to redesign the plane as we're flying it. So um, we have a, a, a electrical infrastructure or energy infrastructure, which um, is, you know, it, it comes from where we were historically 20, 30, 40 years ago through the, the, the sort of mess of deregulation um, to where we are now. And I, I do think that um, we, we probably should talk a little bit about what a good solar project looks like um, without getting too uh, bound up 
in whether or not the the in in whether the only issue is whether the wrecks are being treated in the right way. Um, I I personally think that the 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 current draft of the um, both of the legislation that's in front of the the House and the Senate and the uh, net metering rules um, are going to if passed in their current form are going to lead us to a place where um, there's not going to be very much community ownership of this stuff and there's going to be a lot of utility ownership of the stuff and that that's a, a, a robust public policy di discussion that we we should be having um, it's certainly possible to have a utility that cites these projects responsibly and who works with communities in the same way that a, 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 a what I think of as a good community model um, works but the the fundamental question of where the benefits go and how broad the benefits are spread out um, is one that really still has to be worked out um, so maybe I, I don't I don't want to leave this topic if we're not well, finished wanna, with it can I have some maybe outline the citing recommendations and maybe address how we cracked on comment on which which on of the issues on both the net metering rules and George's comment which I think was right okay. on the mark in in, act, in in the comments in Act 56. So my point was Act 56 as drafted does not significantly change um, the landscape. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't um, have future legislation in the po in, um, in the, there won't be future legislation that fixes the flawed legislation. But a lot of people have come out in, in, in terms of my students report and said, oh, Act 56 has solved all this. That is absolutely not true. Um, in terms of George's comment on on um, what's going to happen to community solar, you know, in terms of um, these these draft rules, he's he's absolutely on the mark. And and one of the things we've been trying to work on our, with our energy clinic is to support solar across um, Vermont that reduces you know Vermont's communities' um, greenhouse gas emissions and Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions. And we've been trying to work on projects that that provide as much of the benefits as we can to Vermonters and members of the Vermont. Vermont communities because we think that that solar both should be something that 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 actually um, reduces our carbon footprint not increases it like the past public policy and we think um, distributed solar should be something that that helps you know um, even out income distributions not something that 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 just puts more um, um, tax credits and other things in 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 the pockets of of, of investors um, so we've been trying to work for community solar and, and George is absolutely right the draft of these rules as they work I mean um, um, we're working um, um, in with a number of other New England states um, on community solar, and if these rules go in place, you know um, we have this you know this law school with these with a dozen students in my clinic wanting to work on this stuff, and we're going to pull out of doing any of this work in Vermont because the only way that we could develop projects is if we mislead people, and I think this is going to be a challenge for a lot of the local developers, solar developers that have just wanted to do solar, you know, sell solar to people and not do these financial gimmicks. But under these current rules, it's not going to be financially feasible for people to put solar on the, the roof of their house and keep their recs or do community solar where you keep the recs or for Middlebury College to do another project like they did with Encore Redevelopment and, and, keep, the, and keep the recs or for Vermont Law School to do a project like we did with Tunbridge Solar and, and, and keep the recs. It's going to be uneconomic. So the people that have actually been doing projects the, the doing the right way, that little fraction of a percent that doesn't show up in the rounding of what's real solar in Vermont and reducing our carbon footprint, those are the people that are being, you know, the, the developers and the, and the citizens doing that are the ones that are going to be put out of business by the draft of these net metering rules. And um, we're going to have, um, you know, the big developers and the people that, that you know, um, that, are, that are happy just to, just to um, turn the stuff over to GMP and imply to people still that they're, that they're going solar. Um, 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 in the process. So, I mean, to me, the, in the short term, the, the biggest fundamental thing that I think a lot of us need to do is to send a message to the Public Service Board and send a message to our legislators and send a message to the Shulman administration that this draft, which may work, may work for the renewable energy industry, may work for investors, it may be something, you know, um, I think the utilities are kind of mixed on, on certain aspects of it, but it doesn't work for community solar, it doesn't work for Vermont ownership, it, it doesn't work for the kind of stuff that ACORN wants to do, I think, and, and we need to send a message that, that our legislator, legislators should be doing solar for Vermonters and, 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 and helping support solar um, owned by Vermonters. Sure, and then we'll pass it on to someone else for a question. One additional thing that I failed to mention earlier is that to the extent the utility owns the solar projects and the solar hardware, it is part of their so-called rate base, which they then turn around and get what's called return on equity, which is currently set at 
So those assets generate revenue for Gas Metro. So yeah, that's correct. Whenever our investor puts money into the infrastructure, it earns a return on investment. So when we put up a power pole, it earns a return on investment. Um, when we buy power, like we buy power from Hydro Quebec, they make nothing on that. That's passed through to customers for the same rate. But if we can build solar cost effectively for our customers, more cost effectively than say buying somewhere else, it still benefits our customers. So what you have to look at is what's the benefit to customers. If building it brings it in at a cost that's beneficial to our customers, more beneficial than something that we don't mark up, then we still make the choice to do that. We, we make the choices to do what we, what's the beneficial to our customers. So, to be clear, well, we the solar and so to be clear, community-owned solar will not happen in the current regime because you, what you've said basically is if the utility can do it cheaper, they get it, and they also get to do a profit on it. So Whereas community solar, if the locus of control is in ownership is in the community yeah. that owns the solar array, those assets are our capital at work, not Green Mountain Powers going to the shareholders in Gas Metro. So just a couple, and I, I've been on vacation the last two weeks, so I am really not up on the new board rules and the legislation. I haven't had a chance to look at them closely. But Green Mountain Power is probably, leads the country as far as a utility that has been supportive of development of solar distributed generation, helping other, helping, encouraging and trying to make it possible for others to do it. So uh, there are utilities across the country that are fighting the ability of others to do it. Green Mountain Power is the one that introduced in the state to put on a financial adder so that customers would get a financial benefit. We're the ones that introduced that. So I think that we have, we have done a lot to support the development of solar and we are totally in support of when people want to do community solar. The Public Service Board is setting up the rules that make sense and I think they're differentiating between whether something is built on a, you know, landfill and that sort of stuff, but that's the kind of thing yeah, they're so looking for, which Maybe is we should look at, what we've been throwing around the term community, what community solar actually means, how important is local ownership? There are a lot of things we do where we don't actually own the asset. There are also some new rules, which Ben, you may be ready to comment on, the security and exchange rules in terms of how you can invest more easily in solar, so we could address that, both those issues of of ownership and how important they are and what community solar means. Well, I, is that I, so I important don't, when there are other ways to get solar? Uh, I, the, the issue with talking about the, the structure of financial regulation that regulates the raising of funds for any uh, project, the, the broad advertisement and, and raising of funds, I think is really secondary to some of the issues that George raised because you only, uh, I mean, you, you have to describe your profits and losses and, and your business model to investors. And if your, your pitch is both that you're green and that you're a good investment and you, you are taking a hit of six cents a kilowatt hour under the current proposed rules um, because you are retaining the RECs in order to, to be able to claim that for the life of your project, then it's the the you're never going to make it to your your, your investors because they'll look at the finances and say we don't think we can make this work. Now I actually think that the 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 current version of the rule doesn't have a six cent penalty. It's got a a three cent penalty. There's a six cent spread, um, so it's a three cent adder. So isn't this isn't the solar adder is being reduced from six cents to three cents? Right. Is I that mean, correct. And we saying that the solar adder if people have solar and they get that back on their bill. That's equivalent to the value of the rec. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I that I don't know how they're set. I don't know how they're setting the value of that adder. I know that when the decision was made to um, to create the adder, um, the idea was to get people who were on the fence about building solar off the fence um, by uh, incentivizing the construction of uh, generation that would help the utilities out exactly when they were hitting their summer peak. So uh, the, there was an, a, a calculation made about the avoided costs of additional transmission, um, and somebody decided that there was headroom to offer this, the, the current uh, solar adder that's, that's in the tariffs. Uh, one thing I should just say is that 
Um, we tend to treat the solar adder as if it's a, a guaranteed income stream, but I want you to remember that it's a fixed financial pie. So what the solar adder is, is a subsidy from current rate payers who are not you building your solar system to incentivize you to do this particular thing. When it's being reduced, we're talking about a reduction of that, that subsidy. Now, I think it's important because people make financial decisions based on the promises that have been made to them and so on and so forth. And uh, I, I think that if you either reduce the amount of the promise or reduce the amount of time that there's certainty about the promise, you get very different behavior from people making those investment decisions. But it's, it's not that the money comes from somewhere. It, it is a, a, a subsidy from exist, an existing class of rate payers. Sure. Uh, my name is Philip Foy. I'm with Encore Renewable Energy. Uh, just to sort of help clarify uh, the difference between a net metering credit and a solar adder, um, what we're specifically talking about here with the three cents plus or minus on top of the net metering credit is a rec-specific credit. Uh, the solar adder was initially proposed by GMP as um, strictly financial. It had nothing to do with the rec, the renewable energy attributes. Um, it was strictly for peak shaving, distribution, and the financial aspects that were um, afforded to ratepayers as a result. What is now being proposed with the board, this three plus or minus, is specific to the REC. And so people throw out solar adder a lot and you think about the net metering credit value that's applied um, from these projects, uh, from net metering, and it can get bundled sometimes because there is a financial aspect to it and there's a renewable energy aspect. And so I just wanted to, to make sure that people understood there is two separate parts to it. There's the um, between those two. But, but the reality is for people that do projects, I mean, you know, essentially if you, if you do a rooftop project and you turn the, you, you turn the RECs over to GMP, you'll get, you'll get three cents over the retail rate. If you um, keep, um, you, you do a rooftop project and you want to keep those RECs, like, you know, people are allowed to do today without any penalty, which is to me the, the basic fundamental premise of, of, of um, net metered solar is that the customer gets the RECs, you will get six cents less then, then, then. So there's a there's really a six cent penalty for people that um, that that want to keep their recs compared to people that turn them over to to, to GMP. Yeah, and I agree there's with Kevin on a lot of things. I think this is one where we disagree. I, I see it as a, a three cent penalty because you're getting the value regardless of whether there was a rec as a net metering customer, you were going to get the residential retail rate, and so. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, I mean, you know, the, the difference between what those two people are paid is six cents. So I don't know how you can say, you know, it's three cents premium over the retail rate for, for someone that does rooftop solar in terms of rec, but the, the person that does the same exact project and keeps the recs gets six cents less than the customer that turns it over to GMP. So it is, it, they, they, they've just did it three above and three below, but when you add it up, it's, it's still a six cent. Um, reduction I feel like in we're getting revenue. into the weeds of RECs, um, and I just want to make sure that people in the audience are able to get their questions answered. And I'd like to get a feel for whether people want to stay in the weeds of RECs and this three cents versus six cents, and what the bottom line is, or broaden it out. Do we want to talk? What can I get? What issues do we want to talk about? Shout, just shout out in terms of solar. Distributed energy. Distributed energy. Okay. Do you want to ask a question about distributed energy? Okay. Hold on. Let me bring you the mic. Hi, uh, I'm Peter Rothschild, live in New Haven. Question for the nice lady from GMP. Uh, distributed uh, power. Yes. It, sound, it sounds great. I'm trying to get my head around it. The population density, ergo the energy usage, is going to be up in Chittenden County. Mm -hmm. We happen to live in New Haven, Addison County. Your little map shows that we're almost saturated. So how do you get people to in put renewable energy up in Chittenden County. You're, you're right. There has been a lot of solar development in the, the Route 7 corridor, particularly in Addison County. And that's, that's where it's been attractive. There's How does that answer the question of distributed energy across the state? So, well, it is, it's, it, there is still distributed energy going out all throughout the state, as opposed to like a, a nuclear plant here, major plants. So we're still doing that. I think that there's a lot of work statewide, really, to help more and more people put up renewable energy. I don't have an answer for targeting it to Chittenden County versus here, but I mean, we're, Green Mountain Power has, um, we just got a permit 
to build um, a two megawatt plant in, um, um, I think it's two megawatts, anyway, a plant in Williston. We're planning to doing another solar plant in Richmond. We are building generation. I was at a hearing last night to put a 4.99 megawatt plant in Williamstown. So there are solar developments going up in other parts of the state as well as the, I think the initial bunch may have gone up in this corridor, but we're, we're, um, we have one that we're proposing for um, Hartford. So we are looking at, at some pretty decent sized projects in other parts of the state. And I'll just throw out there, I'm going to go back to your <laughs> comment of could we zoom out a little bit. Um, you know, solar is part one part of our energy options, right? I mean, we've got conservation, we've got efficiency, then we've got all of our traditional fuels, and then we have all of our renewable fuels. And um, what I struggle with is, uh, you know, also having represented the wind industry, there were many a times that I went to the Northeast Kingdom and folks said, well, when are you going to do wind in Chittenden County? Well, so then there was a wind project uh, proposed in Milton, Georgia. Um, you know, you don't often hear um, folks say, I, I, I don't know how many times folks have said, does Addison County um, export more milk than Addison County uh, residents um, drink. But I guess I, what I want to come back to is where I think Vermonters typically agree is that we do have, uh, a, uh, we all have an incredible connection um, to our state and to uh, living as sustainably as possible. And from there, we start to get into rubs as to, well, how much solar do we want in our backyard? Or how much wind do we want on our mountain ridges? Um, as compared to, uh, you know, how much energy do I, I use if I live 45 miles away from my workplace? Um, I, I, I guess I, I struggle with um, the, the dividing up that I typically hear in the conversation and in the media uh, in terms of, you know, what I've done and what you've done and what we've all done when frankly we're all part of this challenge and we're all part of the solution and and frankly also it really does come right down uh, in the long run to dollars and cents and there are so many uh, to what you said Ben there are so many regulatory challenges uh, in terms of how we value efficiency and how we value renewables and whether or not I mean the the driving price, the driving thing that makes energy, or not energy, that makes power the most value for utilities is whether or not you can have it on demand. Well, guess what doesn't provide that necessarily? Renewables. So, uh, you know, that whole value stream may or may not be there until you get storage. Um, there are other pieces that are just so latent and, and deep within the challenges that we face that it, I, I, it would just be so nice if we could figure out how to figure out what we can agree upon. <laughs> I just want to pick on, uh, up on something that Gabrielle was saying. Um, I, I do think it's worth asking the question in an, in an open way, what, what would make um, Vermonters who, um, on the one hand, are very progressive in the sense of believing in progress as a state, uh, but on the other hand can be very um, uh, concerned about sudden changes to our physical landscape, what would, would make us uh, as communities and as, uh, as a state um, for the sorts of changes that the legislature um, has said we have to have and that I think deep in our hearts we all believe we need to undergo. Um, I actually think that d despite the, the fact that uh, it looks a little dark for the prospects of community solar under the current regime, um, I, I mean, uh, regimen of laws, not regime of, of political regime. Um, uh, I, I, do, I do think that, that community solar uh, or a version of that um, offers us a possible way out. And let me just explain what I mean by that, and I'm happy to to kind of turn this over to others for uh, discussion. Uh, one of the things that I think um, I've seen on the select board in Cornwall um, uh, is a, uh, a concern that when a project comes into town that the problems that that project is solving, whether they're regulatory problems or financial problems, are all problems that are really outside the, the borders of, of the town. Um, if you had um, people in the town seeing what the benefit was to them of a particular project coming to town I think that you would have the buy-in that you really need to have people grasp uh, the the promise of these projects with both hands as opposed to treating them as um, a sudden threat from the outside now what do I mean by that uh, 
Acorn Energy Co-op has come up with a model, and there are other models around the state where um, the the panels um, in a solar project um, would would begin by being owned by an investor that has a tax appetite, who takes the tax credits and the depreciation from those panels um, until they're used up, and then transfers ownership of the panels to the folks who are actually um, getting the energy from the panels. The folks from the who are getting the energy from the panel, panels form a net metering group, um, and they they share the costs of the the maintenance of the 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 array and get the benefits of whatever net metering solar adder um, there might be. So you wind up with a group of local residents who own the panels, or virtually own the panels, they own the project that is producing the energy that they receive. Um, you have a local business with a tax appetite that's gotten to shield some of its income um, uh, using the tax credits and the depreciation that the project throws off. Um, and you, you hopefully have worked uh, proactively uh, with the town uh, to cite it, um, cite the project in such a way that um, everybody who's in the in the process can agree that it's 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 having the least uh, impact on the the town's aesthetic as possible. Um, I I really do believe that there are um, plenty of opportunities to cite projects um, uh, using a model like this, um, but there is no place in the current. Uh, regulatory environment for it. The legislation that's in front of the, the Vermont uh, legislature doesn't contemplate that anybody would come up with an idea this crazy. Um, none of the, um, the rules in front of the Public Service Board contemplate that there might be a kind of local ownership option here. Um, it, the only stuff that's being considered at the moment is a kind of uh, larger ownership model which asks the, the folks who are ratepayers or, or who are investors in this to trust that the, the, the state regulators and the utilities who get these recs are gonna be using um, the recs that a project throws off on balance in the best, of, uh, in the, in the best possible way. Um, it is possible that, that they will. Um, I think that there are plenty of people who would feel better if they owned the panels and knew where the recs were going themselves. Um, and I, I do think that that piece is missing from the current, um, from, from the current debate. Now, having said that, um, is it the case that these these projects should operate without contributing anything to the common wheel? I mean, any of these projects that's feeding electrons onto the grid that have have owners who want their lights on at night need to to be grid tied, which means that they have to um, they have to contribute to the upkeep of that system and and making it all run. Um, and I think that some of the the current changes that are propo being proposed are proposed by actors in the system who, who don't believe that, um, that net metered solar is bearing its, its proper share of those costs. Um, th this is still being worked out. I, I see lots okay. of people who want to say so, something, so I want to shut okay. up. Do you have a question about the group net metering? And can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Dottie Kyle, and I'm president of the Mad River Community Solar Farm. 150 KW just went online last December. Uh, we own. Are, we're a member-owned LLC, and each member of the organization could point to the panels that they own, even though they share in the total output. Uh, we are perplexed when people say, well, you're not pulling your weight. Are we not helping the utility uh, not have to buy more expensive power from out of state? Are we not helping the utility by helping them not have to uh, invest in new power plants, uh, new transmission lines? That's one of the benefits, I believe, of locally produced energy. Uh, that's my question. I would love to have been an accountant. No, I would hate to have been an accountant. I'm glad I'm not an accountant. But there is a lot of analysis that goes behind that. And we have traditionally looked at the solar and said, there are benefits that other people are not recognizing. Just what you cited. Benefits that we don't have to buy on peak power. Benefits that we don't have to build transmission. Reliability benefits. You know, 
I don't know like on this particular day or this particular day what it is, but we've pretty much said we wanted to help support the growth of, of renewable in Vermont. Um, I really can't weigh in on, like I said, the board, what the board has just come out with on the net metering because I just got back from vacation. Um, and I know different utilities uh, may have a different, different utilities in Vermont have a different um, power mix. They peak at a different time. They've got a different investment mix. And so their cost might be different from Green Mountain Power's costs. And we're trying to set rules that work statewide. And that's kind of what we all have to work with. And I know that a lot of people who are much more analytical than I am gotten together from the different utilities in the state to try to work out what really makes sense to move forward in a way that still supports the growth of renewable, but does it in a way that doesn't harm the other customers. And maybe, maybe. Okay, let's have one more comment on this question, and then I'm aware we have about 20 minutes left, so I wanna make sure everybody else has a chance to comment or ask questions. Without a doubt, it's making a difference. Um, the question is, uh, you know, and, and having spent a lot of time staring at the Excel spreadsheets where the utilities no offense, come up with what their value is for your local renewable system as compared to what I think the value is because you did the permitting, you did the construction, you took on the liability, all of those pieces, it gets really, really detailed. And there's a lot of push and rub and friction in terms of, well, I think it's worth this much and I don't and I do and I don't. And uh, that that's, that, without a doubt, there is a value. Um, but, you know, it gets pretty... Uh, pretty detailed at the Public Service Board um, when you start to look at how all those values break down and how, um, how those values are valued. So it sounds like you've contributed more than you think you do. There's a lot of that sweat equity in getting that, that project going. Yeah, let, let me just talk about two, two very significant things about Mad River Community Solar, which is a, which is a fabulous project in, in two ways. So, so the, 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 the people um, that have um, invested in that project are getting the 19 cents a kilowatt hour. This is um, renewable energy in Vermont. This is carbon reduction for Vermont. And it's local ownership. So the, to the extent that there's some long-term savings or benefits there, it's going to, to Vermonters in a community and, and, it's in, in, and our net metering is helping um, having those economic benefits stay locally, so yeah, and and, and that's why it's it's you 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 kept the RECs bundled, and that's why it's 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 renewable energy in Vermont, you know, for you know, and it's reducing our carbon um, footprint. Um, let's take another um, one of these other community solar projects that strips the RECs off them and calls it community solar, although that's not my definition Maybe of it. Someone else who wants to um, speak. We we pay that 19 cents a kilowatt hour, and it's not local carbon reduction. It's 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 um, we don't know who the investors are on that. So I think I think your project is is adding a lot of value for the same cost, um, you know, um, to Vermont, which are the things I think that people think that we should get out of our solar, which is local carbon reduction and in economic benefits to the, so the local owners. Do we have someone else involved with a community solar project who may want to speak about theirs or ask questions regarding their project? Uh, but you have another question. A comment? Yeah, okay. It's stepping back again. It's uh, stepping back to... Kevin, I like most of what you say, but you keep talking about the carbon footprint in Vermont. And according to Governor Douglas, we have the only, we're the only state that has a positive carbon footprint. Uh, if you just look at the number of trees versus people. Uh, when Vermont Yankee was shut down, energy was shut down, why didn't, and I guess I'd be addressing this to Dottie, just uh, take, I mean, we were already getting a third of our total power from uh, Hydro-Quebec, why didn't we just get two thirds of it rather than creating a false sense of urgency? I mean, right now we're maxed out on the western part of Addison County as Peter put out, based on your map, there's five towns out there, and I, I'm not speaking for the town of New Haven, but I'm on the planning commission, mm -hmm. and we're dealing with Ann Bark right now. So why, don't we go why didn't we go with Hydro-Quebec? Hydro-Quebec is, is renewable. Okay, let's, let's so, first of all, it's really important in our electric portfolio to have a diverse mix of resources. Just in your financial portfolio, you wouldn't want to have it all in one company, and a few years ago when we were looking at our future, we had like 40% from Vermont Yankee. 
35% from Hydro-Quebec, and both of those are too much from any single resource. So what we were trying to negotiate with for my Yankee, we were gonna get less. As it turns out, we were able, never able to reach agreement with them on price. I don't know if you remember, but their last offer was 6.1 cents a kilowatt hour, which would be about twice what we would need to pay now. I mean, it's so good that we did not take Vermont Yankee's last offer. But if we were to take all of that from Hydro-Quebec, that would be a lot from one resource, and we would have to build additional transmission. I don't think we could get that amount of power in the state. And we really want a much more diverse mix, because if something happens to one type of resource, then you're really hurting. You're much more protected if you have a diverse mix. So we, we're buying power in the market. Um, you know, I mean, the amount of solar that we're getting is, is really still a fairly small part of our mix. Um, I mean, it's not all coming from New Haven, but we are really working to get a diverse mix, and we're doing it in a way, our power supply folks are trying to, to layer it in in a way that really minimizes the risk to our customers, so it's, we, I don't know if that is very helpful to you or not. Price. What? Do we want to have one more comment on this question, and then I want to allow some other questions from the audience? I might, just I might just one? comment on. Bill, then Kevin will make one comment. I might just comment on, um, you know, ha having represented all of the renewable energy technologies, um, you know, I understand that folks from New Haven, uh, you know, there's some folks from New Haven that are, are feel like they've done enough solar in their town. Similarly, there are folks that look at Hydro Quebec, and although it is renewable by Vermont state law, there are some folks that look at Hydro Quebec and say that's damaging to the environment. Um, there are folks that say you cut down trees and use it to heat your home, that's damaging to the environment. So I guess my question is, you know, how do you weigh all these pieces up? The other thing is, in terms of the prime ag land, you know, I've spoken with a lot of farmers who have chosen to use their land for uh, solar, and I, I hear something different. Um, I'm not a farmer, so, but I hear something different from them, which is that uh, if there are portions of their land that they cannot use for farming, for agriculture, um, that, you know, when they have to make a choice between um, selling a portion of their farm for, uh, you know, to pay off property tax or whatnot, as compared to putting in a 20 to 25 year long solar array that actually has minimal impact to the land, um, that that actually works really well for them in terms of long-term land use planning. Uh, it might be a different to the view. It might be a difference in terms of the short-term um, uh, you know, agricultural use, but that's what I've heard from farmers because I've asked quite a few of them, so why'd you do this? Because people who are asking, you know, what does this do to our farming land? Yeah, I mean, that's true. There are farmers w which will say they'll get more per income from solar panels than they will from a crop, and it's, and it's guaranteed income, but that's not true for all farmers. Yeah, yeah, there, there are other regulations with agriculture. Yeah, there are other regulations at play with agriculture, that's true. And uh, I think Kevin had a comment about this question, and then I want to go to another. I just want to say very quickly Quick. about um, I mean, I think Gabriel had said, and, and I think everyone said about that we have to be realistic about our goals, and we can't, you know, um, there's a cost to this. And, and I, I absolutely agree with that. The, the problem where we've been with our goals, we put this 90% goal out there, we create this perception that, that we're a leader in, in doing solar and renewable energy, and the reality is our public policies are, are exactly in the opposite of that. So I think having an honest, getting, getting rid of the 90% goal or you know, stop talking about things that we're really not planning to do and, and talk about what our policies are today and what we can do today and what we can do tomorrow and what we can do the next year that's real, real honest development that, that, you know, that is well cited and um, reduces Vermont's carbon footprint and that is affordable. If we can't really, if we have to sell the wrecks from all this stuff because we can't afford it, then, then why are we doing it, you know? Um, why are we doing it in the first place? Because we're just, we are having land use impacts on people in, in, in New Haven and other, other places and we're really not having public policies that are meeting meeting those goals. So I think wiping the state the slate clean and putting in putting in public public policies that are that are honest renewable energy public policies that that can support you know um, real development of 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 solar that that is that is consistent with with um, um, you know local and regional plans and and I certainly agree too that you, know, you, you can develop um, good projects on on farmland. We we work with two CSAs where we've done community solar projects that are just absolutely you know to me well-developed um, yeah, projects. It depends on the size of the country and the farmer. I know we have a question from our audience. 
Yeah, my name is Mark Cesari. I'm from Cornwall. I am a farmer, um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I understand there has to be sacrifices to land in some places. There's some marginal land. I've also seen a lot of projects go up on good land. Grass is a solar panel, and there's not really any embodied energy in grass, so, you know, um, there can be a lot of carbon sequestration done with good grazing methods, so, you know, depending on, you know, what land we're talking about. So I understand there has to be sacrifices, but I'm, I'm seeing a lot of projects go on, you know, Nice land, so just what I had to say. Thank you for the comment, Mark. I think it is important to remember how much carbon we can store with our grasslands. So when we're harvesting, we don't always have to harvest solar. The grass will, so with, through photosynthesis, is going to store a lot of carbon in the soils, and that's often what we forget in the equation. So beyond the solar, there's a bigger picture in terms of carbon footprinting. So we have time for about two more questions. Do I have one? Two, and it may be three, so one, two, okay, here we go. This is a question on a smaller scale. I have a four and a half kilowatt system on my house. I'm basically net zero, uh, not on colder seasons, but for this last season, I have a credit. Now, I receive a letter from GMP that this credit will, quote, expire, unquote, and I'm trying to find out, um, am I, what they're basically saying is, I cannot produce more energy than I consume on a yearly basis, even though I would think that would be beneficial. So I would like to know why am I, for, for example, I asked what are my monthly payments going to be going forward? And basically what they said, they are your solar incentive. It has nothing to do with net production. And I'd like to know why that is. So net metering was really designed to work so that you generate enough for your own use. It wasn't really originally designed that you would generate extra because essentially then Green Mountain Power is buying it f renewable energy from you for 19 cents a kilowatt hour when we might be able to buy energy somewhere else for 7 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's not really economic for all the customers to have people build net medium projects bigger than their use. We're not allowed to let those excess credits not expire, but we know that customers aren't really happy about it, and we're trying to work through some other ways to help deal with those, uh, those excess credits. But the idea is that you're really supposed to build, that's the design, to build your own net metering for your own use and not for, e for sale extra. In other words, even though when I produce the electricity, it might be worth more than what I'm actually getting for it, because it's during the middle of the day, maybe in summer, uh, that's not it, kind It's of really not worth more on an annual basis than what you're getting for it, I don't okay, believe. Okay, so how does, how does that differ from CSAs? So that may be a question. I'm wondering, Dottie, can people take questions with you after this? Of course. Because that's something that of you... Of course. Sure. Um, because we also have, uh, I don't want to throw out smart meters. People may have questions about that. Because there may I'll be I'll different I'll be here as late as you want. About. I'll answer anything. But I know we have another question in the back here. Someone had their hand up. And probably we have time for one more question after that. I guess I'm in the same uh, ballpark as the last person that asked the question that uh, we're seeing things retired that Green Mountain Power has had the access to sell to someone else that we're losing that accumulated energy that we did not use. And our system, we're close to net zero as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it produces about a thousand kilowatt hours more a year than we used. But we need uh, the summer production to deal with the winters. So, so th these are credits that expire like a year after right. you would have used them. So, if you use as much in a year as you generate, you're not going to have excess credits at the end of <laughs> excess credits at the end of the year. I mean, it's supposed to work so that if you generate more in the summer and use more in the winter and end up net zero, net zero, no, that's fine. We don't, and you can have excess credits that you can use over the next few months, but you're after a year, they're supposed to expire. They go, so yeah. basically But you could set up a group. You could set up, uh, actually I have a friend who has excess, I can't say that word, excess credits. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, if you want to set me up as part of your 
group. You know, you can assign the credits to me and I'll pay you back because I didn't invest in your solar. You know, you, you can set up groups so that they're used and they're not lost. And will you help customers do that? Because if you plan on a one system and they're yeah. going to use another, that's something we should talk about. Well, yes. we, we haven't had any luck talk calling up Green Mountain Power. We usually get someone that says, well, I don't know, I'll call you back or I'll have someone call you and that's the end of the discussion. Yeah. The, Okay, and, and, and I apologize if people didn't know. It's, it's only been relatively recently that there's been clarity on the state that we had to expire, from the state that we had to expire them. So depending on when you talk to people, and I apologize if our customer service people didn't know better than that, that but there, it was kind of mushy a while ago, and then it became clear from the state that no, we had to have them expire. So that is clear now, but we're also trying to work out ways to kind of help people who can't use them up or who are not able to form a group soon enough because we know that's a problem and we're trying to help ways to solve it so you don't lose it. Okay, uh, two, two more questions. And one more? I'm, well, it's all related to okay. the same thing. It's all related to the bill we get from Green Mountain Power. Uh, when we track back through the last year to try to figure out what, how you calculated what was going to be retired at the end of July, the six cent adder is being retired as well as the excess energy. You know what? That's a level of, I don't know, uh, because that, I don't deal with customers' like bills we're, directly. We're being promised something that is never going to happen. So, Dottie, you will give this man your card, right? So you I can will. follow up. Yeah, I, I think that's the best thing yeah. about your individual bill and which credits are retiring. Um, do we have any other questions? We have time for one more question. Or comments. What can a, an ordinary citizen do to uh, get their voice heard at in Montpelier? What uh, meetings, hearings, etc., uh, are in the works? I, I'm sure everybody on the panel would say the same thing. I mean, I think you need to um, write to your representatives um, and um, uh, and and make your voice heard through them. Um, I found them to be relatively responsive, uh, at least in terms of listening. I'm never really sure where the uh, where the effort goes um, in terms of of, of outcome. I, I have a real short clarification. I recommend you go to Montpelier tomorrow and camp at the House Natural Resources and Energy Committee, who is now considering Bill S230, and ask for an opportunity to provide testimony. Yes. They are considering a bill through the end of this week. My guess is if you don't get to them before then, it's going to get voted out of committee and go further, probably get voted on by the legislature at large. Thank you, thanks. Are you commenting on this question as well? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I was, I've probably testified three or four times before uh, the Senate, uh, the House, the Solar Siting Task Force. It's all a very open process go online, they've got a, a calendar, you can actually email your uh, representative or your senator, you can probably contact their secretary, and it's a pretty low bar to be able to uh, contribute. And you know, I really think anybody who really cares and is interested should do it. And I think that we, we, also, we also have various groups like VCAN and VPIRG. We want to send comments to, to them especially if they're working on the issue. They could say something on your behalf as a collective voice. The, the Public Service Board also takes public comment on their, their, the reason why the rulemaking takes so long is that it's a very open and public process. Um, and they, th you can write to them and they will, um, they will certainly read your comment. Uh, once again, you know, it's sometimes very hard to tell what the effect is of um, one person making a comment in a situation like that. But I think you have to consider that if you're even sitting in this room, uh, you probably care more than the average citizen <laughs> does about these issues. And um, you know, I, I think you should do it if you've got a, a point of view that you think needs to be represented there. And I'll have one more comment, which is um, sometimes actually what reverberates the most with folks who work in Montpelier is if you write an article to VT Digger. Um, and sometimes you have the most airtime that way. You might also get some uh, strong comments back at you, um, but that's a that's a way to uh, have your voice heard. 
and I just like to last say is, I mean, um, for anyone that's that's interested in impacting the PSB rules, um, we're putting together some materials, you know, to help um, um, educate people on some of the changes that aren't going to support community solar. So, if you e email us at energyclinic at vermontlaw.edu, um, we will get those materials out um, to you. And for anyone that's um, any any members of the communities are working on um, projects or um, want, want assistance with with community-owned um, local solar, um, we're there to 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 help um, any way any way that we can in the future. So, um, you know, um, uh, we don't really want to deal with individual bill, individual issues between uh, GMP and customers, but um, anything in terms of projects or 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 advice or help, you know, in terms of um, going solar, um, we'd be glad to help. I mean, likewise, Acorn can act as a conduit. So that's the point of this panel, is having your voice heard, hearing from some experts. So if there's a way that we can help out in future panels like this, and we're happy to do so. And our panelists may be able to stay for a couple more minutes. It is 8.30 now, so I would like to end on time. But I said thank you very much. It's really tackling a tough subject with so many aspects. And I appreciate you being here. And, and thank you for, for listening as well and sticking with us.